All right, uh, time is one uh, fifteen. It's uh, time to start. Uh, as you perhaps heard, uh, we are um, recording this uh, seminar. Um, I'm sure you're all um, acquainted with uh, the standard uh, Zoom uh, seminar etiquette. Uh, you, you, we will have a Q&A uh, towards the end. And uh, one easy way to uh, record uh, your questions uh, during the talk is to put them in the chat and I can then use that to, to uh, distribute the word to you during the uh, Q&A um, at the end. Uh, it's my great, great pleasure to uh, introduce today's speaker. Uh, Yannick Schell, who's a senior lecturer uh, in sociology of law at uh, Lund University. She will talk about AI, law, and ethics, from ethics washing to ethics bashing towards another form of ethics via post-humanist theory. So let's hear what all that is about. Yannick, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Ole, and thanks you for and thanks for inviting me to this uh, context or this setting. Uh, I look forward to talk to you, and uh, I'm sorry that I had to cancel last time due to different symptoms of a cold, which was not COVID, at least according to the test. So, uh, as Ole said, I'm senior lecturer in sociology of law at Lund University, and I have a background actually from Gothenburg, where I did my entire uh, law master and I did it uh, also together with Chalmers at the intellectual capital management program. And then I uh, also did my doctoral studies at um, the law department in Gothenburg. So Lund uh, is quite new to me and I'm always happy to reconnect also with Gothenburg and Gothenburg researchers. So if and now I don't know, of course, if all of you are based in Gothenburg, but to those who are uh, very happy to uh, also discuss um, different types of projects in the future. So, and for the others as well, of course. So today I will speak about AI, ethics and law, three topics that have become more and more integrated, I must say, in the uh, recent um, policy discussions both on business or market level and in uh, relation to governance, such as in the EU context, where we've had seen, where we've seen a, a number of new um, legislative efforts recently that probably will come out as new laws as well. So um, before I start, I'm gonna say that I am uh, I am a trained lawyer, but I'm also going to say things about law that probably is not what most people would associate with law. And that is because I come from a critical background where I also have like a project in uh, infusing law with these kind of questions of ethics and uh, try to reconsider what law is in the digital setting. And even more so now in the AI setting. And uh, as a lawyer, I'm just going to get my presentation up. Um, okay, we have it. As a lawyer, uh, I tend to work with this very broad definition of AI, which I think uh, uh, probably more uh, tech savvy persons would. Uh, think differently about, but as an example of uh, how uh, lawyers think and why lawyers think this way in relation to AI, uh, I have put up this um, uh, piece from the preamble of the recent EU AI regulation draft, where there is this very wide definition of what an AI system should uh, be understood to be and why it is important to understand it in this wide sense. So uh, the aim from a strictly legal point of view or a, a very traditional point of view uh, to have these kind of wide definitions with certain openings towards what we can define to be included in this type of technology is that 
um, we do not want to um, be need. We don't want to have to constantly reform law to um, cope with new technological challenges. And therefore, it is uh, open to some degree. Of course, there need to be some kind of refinement so that it doesn't cover too much. And this is what the debates recently have been uh, about, that uh, some actors think that it is too wide and some think it's too narrow and so on. So, but anyway, so I work with a very broad definitions of, a, of AI. And as you will see, I aim to connect even more things than what one usually would connect to AI to create more of a, um, an ethical response through law uh, in relation to AI. So I will not like define it even more. I'm sure that all of you have different ideas of what AI is. So I will leave that discussions a bit and just say that from a legal perspective, uh, probably most of uh, your ideas would fit into this uh, definition, at least those things that you can imagine right now. So, um, okay. And when it comes to ethics, uh, which is the topic of this talk today, um, one can also say that there's been a, a lot of uh, talk recently about how um, AI needs to behave ethically or we need to have AI that is ethical and an example of that is um, the discussions in relation to how data sets are being produced and used in order to train uh, AI or train for machine learning so that uh, um, AI is able to recognize its surroundings. So there has been a lot of discussions that uh, it is important to fix this normative bias, fix these kinds of problems that one can have from having a limited data set towards uh, including data to produce better data sets so that it doesn't perpetuate certain structures in society such as racism and sexism. Um, and I don't know how aware you are about these cases that to me are quite common, but there are, uh, for example, the ImageNet data set where um, there has been a lot of criticize, um, critique raised against, um, against uh, uh, actors using this database of images that are mapped onto um, different descriptive terms in a way that have indeed perpetuated racism and sexism. So um, when, uh, when market actors respond to these kind of critiques, uh, it's usually by finding a way to uh, incorporate more, um, like better data, uh, more robust data and so on. And this is also uh, a big theme in the trustworthy AI um, guidelines that also is an a, a, is a document from the EU where um, a big discussion was how to create uh, AI in a way that makes it ro robust and safe for humans. Uh, and um, one can also notice that Many of these discussions um, have been unfolding in relation or in connection to the development of autonomous vehicles, where the risks for uh, human life has been understood to be very high. And also, of course, when it comes to autonomous weapons and such. So these are understood as um, areas where we need to have very robust and safe um, ways to produce AI and the output should be safe. And uh, so these are kind of these responses, as I will talk a bit more uh, later, are all kind of ethical responses that focuses on transparency and uh, the possibility to um, improve the data set, so like just change the kind of data set or change the way that something is technologically designed. Um, and 
so it's an ethics that still very much um, corresponds to an idea of what is um, good reason for these kind of AIs. And an alternative way to think about ethics is to think about it much more in the sense of what kind of effects it produces for the society in general. So for example, if there is a lot of energy needed to produce certain technologies or minerals or uh, other kind of constellations or if property is being claimed on more and more parts, that could also be included in what we need to think about when you think about ethics. But that is not really uh, something that um, the general discourse is about now. So this is what I will talk a bit more about. But to do that, we also need to have some idea about what law is and what law does and for whom. And as I told you, I was now talking about law in the strict sense and probably law as you all know about it and as most of us know about it in Western societies. And that is uh, as a form of legislative, order or a state bound order that is that settle conflicts in court or that regulates behavior uh, via transparent norms um, and furthermore that it's something that uh, lawyers work with so lawyers practice law and uh, it is a, a separate system in that sense and what this also means is that law is understood as something that is made by humans and for humans and to govern human societies. And this might feel uh, so self-evident that it doesn't need to be said, but I say it because I um, there's a, a purpose of thinking differently about law in, um, in uh, AI, in an AI setting, but in a digital setting in general. And uh, why we need to do this is that we can now say that we have a trajectory of changes or transformations of law under digitalization, where we started quite early on with debates about how code is replacing law and therefore automatically regulates the context in which it is embedded. And here, uh, one of the, or the most prominent figure to talk about this is uh, Lawrence Lessig. And so he, even in the uh, end of the nineties, he started this discussion about what happens when law is losing its role as a, a regulating system and when, in that uh, in that time it wasn't even uh, like a lot of private actors but it was a possibility that private actors could regulate uh, the internet via coding it into how a certain website or such is is um, um, experienced by the user what one can do in the at the web uh, website and today this is almost also so self-evident that code has these effects because we know now how our um, platform-based society or platform capitalist society has used law and has used code uh, in ways to um, lock us in in different types of social media infrastructures and regulate our behaviors by um, end user license agreements and community guidelines and different other kinds of uh, soft legal tools, but also through how the web page is designed and what, in which way we are, in which directions we are nudged when we uh, visit these um, web pages. And um, so this is kind of, it links in, I'm gonna jump over the Lex Cryptographica for a moment. It links very well into the more recent discussions about how we are in a situation where we have algorithmic governance as a standard in digital settings where 
um, algorithms are designed to make us stay in a certain place or a certain at a certain space, digital space for a longer time, or pushing us to buy something, pushing us to swipe on something or someone. <laughs> so this kind of um, coding of digital spaces and how it expresses itself as a, a, an actual law is uh, a big part of what we say is transformation of law under digitalization and AI. Because, and I, I mean, maybe this is too, maybe this is also so uncontroversial to, to say today, but we have after all, just come from uh, an idea of law and society as something that is uh, regulated by the state or nation states. So to have moved this kind of decision-making and also decision-making over seeing my public places to private actors via hidden to the, to the eye, at least to the human eye, structures um, of governing via technology is also new in the sense uh, compared to the previous order. And another aspect of how law has transformed under digitalization and also increasingly under technologies that we relate to AI, such as blockchain and Bitcoin, is through uh, what uh, some scholars have called Lex Cryptographica. So uh, not only are our um, digital worlds or our laws in the digital world um, integrated into the spaces that we um, find online, but also we have another layer of encryption that is becoming more and more popular and it's also because it's seen as a vital step to um, move towards more Internet of Things and smart cities as the connections um, between the endpoints involved need to be secure. So increased encryption, increased, um, possibly increased decentralization, but still um, a move where more can be locked in into a chain and less easier study those. And as we think about law in the, in the way that compared to how we think about law in the traditional way. And then we have another big move, I would say, and that is how also the images that machines need to be behave in an independent way or an autonomous way to read the, um, their surroundings are not the same images as we see as we like. Even if we can say, for example, this is the example of the image net, even if we can say that there is a uh, difference in how we classify different images uh, also between humans and that is a problem there is an even more added complexity when we think about um, how these autonomous um, vehicles for example are to navigate the surroundings their surroundings and uh, the images they need or produce to make sense of their surrounding are then a form of operational images that help them understand what to do, but we cannot deconstruct these images. We cannot make sense of these images just by looking at them. So when governance is embedded into machines and the, uh, by uh, the possibility to interpret the world as images, another kind of complexity for law happens. So law is again, possibly being transformed into something that is hard to make sense of from, an, from a traditional legal perspective, at least. So, okay. And then there are some more known ethical dilemmas for law under AI. And for example, then, uh, and something that I have worked a lot with is that the concept of ownership is uh, very different today. And it's very different in general, of course, in intellectual property than in, in physical property. But 
um, it has uh, come to be um, become more of a cluster uh, concept where uh, it's not only whether an object is uh, covered uh, by a property right that makes it into something that one can own, but involved into these kind of holdings of assets, digital assets and physical assets related to the, the digital assets are many other layers such as digital rights management in the beginning, click wrap agreements and end user agreements, blockchain technologies, and now NFTs, and of course, also data. So even if there is no law that says that you can own data and this is how you can own it, um, there are, uh, it's an assumption that you can control certain elements through contract, and then we have limitations in, for example, privacy law, but uh, there are many ways to get around these kind of ideas what a property object uh, is, and you don't need, it doesn't need to be said in law to be a property object. So one can say then that the ownership, the concept of ownership, which uh, the, the expansion of the concept of ownership is an ethical dilemma for law, because law, again, operates with an idea that everything that um, is uh, a property object should be defined or at least be possible to derive from a certain um, legislation to create transparency. And then uh, other topics that you probably have heard about and uh, talked about maybe even in these settings include how marketing and political speech uh, have been hard to identify and regula regulate uh, for the state. And this has a lot of things to do with um, uh, algorithmic type of governance as well, where we have concepts such as nudging uh, and uh, how both societies and companies try to affect uh, persons and uh, also uh, uh, non-persons, so to speak, or non-humans or more than humans to behave in in certain way. And another example of this kind of convergence between marketing and political speech is, of course, uh, through influencers where influencers act as private persons or political persons, but they also uh, very much act in the form of a commercial persona. And not everything that they say are things they sell, but uh, everything they do still goes into the building of the um, commercial persona that sometimes sell things. And here, as you probably also know, there are also examples of um, entirely um, automated influencers or uh, on, the, on the verge of being entirely automated influencers, which will, again, add another layer of complexity for law because it becomes uh, just like in the sense of when we have business actors um, performing on the market, we need to be able to identify what, who is the person behind it, or is it a, a legal persona that should be behind it and such. So uh, that's another kind of ethical dilemma because it's super important, of course, for law to be able to recognize what is uh, marketing and what is political speech because they are regulated entirely differently. And of course, in the Western legal idea of law, political speech is a core of law. And another core that we have in our most of our societies right now is the, the necessity of work and also work and the right tied to work in most societies um, are of course placed under the ethical but also legal dilemma that gig works and platform optimization in relation to gig, gig works uh, afford. Uh, and how people are ranked, what way they are, can check out from their um, the gigs and how they are allowed to uh, behave during these types of um, micro works, we should call it, uh, is also uh, a big ethical dilemma, but also like a dilemma for law. 
And then there's a lot of other of these kind of things, responsibility, inventorship, and other similar concepts related to how we define human personhood and legal subjectivity in law uh, are also a bit in flux because the law considers the human um, as the uh, standard for legal subjectivity. So when new things are added to how uh, or to what we include as human subjectivity, there's also a need to uh, reshape these kind of ideas. And also in terms of inventorship, when it comes to AI, would if, it, if an AI would invent something, would it also have the same rights as a human and such? Are questions being talked about? And uh, privacy also relates to the discussion in the, in the political speech versus marketing, uh, where we have seen and uh, also our private spheres being transformed under the digitalization and under AI probably will be even more so because we will have even more dynamic possibilities to um, also create new zones of privacy. I did a talk last week uh, actually at the RCA in London about the project that they run there on the metaverse, which they call the metahuman. And a lot of these questions that could that we have seen already. I oh, sorry, now I'm gonna go a bit. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So many of the concepts that we have seen already in the previous discussions about data collection and who owns our digital personas and who controls them and such will also be uh, even more relevant when we uh, might construct further our digital lifestyles into those kind of metaverses. And let's see how much we're gonna get into this just briefly, I think. So uh, as you might know, then uh, a way for law to address these challenges has been to uh, impose data protection. And, and the GDPR, for example, establishes certain rights for natural persons to control their data in the sense that one needs to consent and some um, some type of data some types of data collection require informed consent so like a strength informed consent and you have right to access your data and you have a right for rectification or erasure uh, also known as the right to be forgotten so, and besides these rights that are tied to individuals, which is a very common way to do things in law, to, to create new rights, uh, the entire human rights um, debate uh, and what, who can have rights and which rights that are tied to humans uh, is like very, um, it's a very, it's a big debate as such, but it's also something that has been the trend for the, past decades, several decades to, uh, in the way that law responds to questions of ethics or justice. And, but here we also have another uh, kind of invention in the Data Protection Act, where there, besides these individual rights, we also have um, different types of requirements on how uh, data protection should be built into the technologies that are used when you are collecting data and that you're only, uh, you only are allowed to uh, collect the necessary data and so on. So that is kind of a more, um, it's a more layered approach to, to how one can address what is needed to deal with these questions. 
And, uh, and then, as I said, we have these kind of uh, guidelines for trustworthy AI where ethical figures uh, under law, but uh, of course, law could be part of the ethical and robust uh, response to uh, what, what is an ethical AI. So, but these three components seem to run through quite a lot of the discourses on AI level on EU level. And uh, in another example is, or another characteristic in these legislations is that they tend to separate between AI system and uh, AI systems and high risk AI systems in order to uh, require more for systems that could be of uh, special concern in order to safeguard um, human rights, especially human rights to like life and more uh, strong rights. So <clears throat> just to say something about what type of ethics that these type of drafts, both the guidelines and the law draft, AI law draft um, corresponds to, one can say that it does foreground transparency, non-discrimination, risk ass assessment of technologies that are being deployed. So that is a kind of uh, response to another kind of ethics that we can see uh, that we cannot see in, in, in these examples where we have had, where the data sets are um, racist or sexist based on what kind of data, how data has been collected and classified. So in that sense, it can be, uh, that's a, 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 an ethical response to those um, concerns that have been uh, raised in academic and non-academic settings. Uh, the AI law draft or the EU uh, laws do not necessarily foreground um, environmental costs of AI systems. It is something that is addressed throughout, but in general, the AI Act is still very much focused uh, on uh, human life, human sustainability, that these kind of technology should be sustainable or uh, transparent and non-discriminatory for humans. And that can be fine, I mean, it depends on what kind of uh, ID, political IDs you come in with, but it is very clear that um, there is a desire to have AI in society and there's a desire to have even high risk systems in this, as long as they comply with uh, regulations. And this is not something that is, that the fact that maybe it would be better to not do it for the sake of the environment is not something that is, is being discussed much, rather it is seen as a promise uh, that uh, AI can be used to uh, use resources more efficiently in society and hence be good for the environment. And so, but it uh, leaves intact, of course, intellectual property rights and property rights in general. So it doesn't, uh, it doesn't ban <laughs> much in terms of um, commercial um, commercialization of AI, there are some. There were some stricter writings. I don't know if these are in the final um, proposal on uh, actually banning uh, the type of marketing that nudges us into uh, too aggressive um, purchasing um, spirals. So there are, were some kind of um, discussions about that and unclear how it uh, will come out. But anyway, in like the general trend is that um, it is a desired, the, like the AI, AI in general is a desired uh, focus also in terms of business in for EU. So what one can say then is that the AI Act seems to um, focus on an ethics that is largely anthropocentric, so largely human focused, and it uses rights and it discusses rights a lot. And in that, to that extent, one can say that it is 
mostly about safeguarding towards uh, against an AI that would be too human like or too intelligent rather than to think about it in a bigger system. I would say that it's still further than many other um, ways to think about AI in this sense. So it is quite promising in that it sees many more layers than what one, one could expect. But it is very much uh, some kind of Turing test and trying to test whether something is an AI or not and how we can de discover and, and so. Uh, okay, so uh, well, but on the other hand then, so if we don't have this uh, ethics washing that especially large companies have been accused of doing, um, and if we don't think that ethics is supported in the EU um, setting is enough, uh, are we then turning towards a, a perspective of ethics bashing where we say that there's nothing into it or that, because that's also been another trend, especially in research where um, we have seen a move from this kind of um, ethical AI or the need to produce ethical AI to critique these as being insufficient. And um, I agree that it is uh, insufficient or inefficient when it is something that we require own, like that there are no laws that require companies to uh, take on these kind of critiques that have been raised in relation to ethics. But uh, the, EU, um, the EU regulation at least seem to go a bit further because they are placing, uh, they are making more uh, non-negotiable negotiable demands about what kind of ethical, um, what kind of ethics or what kind of, um, what kind of norms that one is allowed to create through AI. But then again, even if we regulate it, uh, will it still, will it be enough? Will it be enough to think that law can actually transform these settings um, by, having these types of regulations. And so, uh, and to this, I <laughs> cannot say that I know, but what we know about law so far is that it has been transformed a lot in the digital setting. We have seen a large uh, marketization of uh, digital elements and digital spaces. And even now when we move into building smart cities and uh, digitalizing even more our society, we an automization uh, auto uh, in society, we can see that uh, a lot of market actors are invited and involved in these settings. So um, will, will it be enough? to regulate it uh, and like, will law be enough uh, to actually produce another type of ethics? And uh, to this, I think then, <clears throat> no, not possibly not. And, but what then are our options? And here comes the really abstract things then, because uh, uh, so I would advocate for a post-humanist or more than human, ethics where um, theoretical insights from that research stream, which is uh, called either posthumanism or new materialisms, are more to the front because in that sense, um, in that type of ethics, one has a much more fluid understanding of where the law starts and ends, but still with uh, an ethical idea of how to um, actually use these types of uh, materialities that shape people's behaviors and, and not only people, but also more than humans and non-humans or inhuman uh, bodies. So, and here it becomes a lot about how to create sustainability 
across species, not only prioritizing the human life world as we know it now, which is not necessarily sustainable even for most humans, but to think about how we can plan resources differently and if all technologies are worth to um, worth advancing, so to say. And in this, it also becomes a goal to find the missing peoples in, um, in this eco society that we are involved with. And this can be either to try to transform different data sets so that it would be more uh, of, uh, of um, more attuned to the societies that we want to create. But that is also quite simplified since this we who wants to create something can vary a lot. And just because we can think, we can, especially here in Sweden can sit, say, uh, can sit here and say that we don't want racist or sexist data set, doesn't mean that this is a truth that transpires to all societies, unfortunately. So um, that kind of finding the missing people have also have to do in trying to have to do with trying to reframe society in a way so that um, there wouldn't be these massive destructions that we see today at least. So uh, in doing that, then one also needs to foreground the materiality of media, all medias that are involved in creating these um, types of technologies. And then we also include the resources that are mined and that labor exploited that um, in order to create AI. Because again, there's a tendency when we talk about AI to only talk about the inno innov innovative work that is needed in order to create it. We have this, a lot of these courses on how to um, uh, transform society towards uh, understanding AI, but a lot or, and being a better um, business person in terms of AI. But we have very little um, knowledge on the, uh, the labor and that is being carried out in the entire production of AI. And another thing is, of course, to foreground this perspective, which we often see a lot in Sweden, I must say, how uh, AI is about to um, trying to reshape our society in a way that it can become habitable also in the future. So a form of terraforming, but for, uh, for the earth and also not only for the humans on earth, but um, stop the mass extinction going on of other species. So, so that's like the big role <laughs> that could also be involved in ethics, but it would also require us to think differently about these big things such as law and, and ethics, and not only everything in AI, but also these kind of aspects and for who we are producing, who is producing law, law for whom and with what kind of normative purpose or ethics. Okay, now I think I talked almost 45 minutes. So if someone wants to ask questions or comment, I would be very happy and like any kinds of thoughts. Maybe we can first give mm -hmm. a, a quick applaud for Janike, a very interesting talk, uh, and then open up for questions. While you guys think about what to ask from this very rich talk, let me mention something that came up in the chat. Uh, Jack Eslick pointed out uh, a very recent paper by Andrea Uwe and Seth Baum, uh, which uh, emphasizes this uh, move towards non-anthropocentrism that you talk about here in this last slide. And as it happens, we have scheduled, it has not been announced on the web yet, but we have scheduled Andrea Uwe to give uh, the next AI ethics seminar on February 22nd. Excellent. Uh, so that's five weeks from now, and she will talk about exactly this. Oh, I will book it then. 
I hope I have a, a gap in my calendar. Nice. I hope so too. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, questions or comments? We have something from, no, that's just, thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, other questions or comments beyond that? <laughs> I pushed in so much. <laughs> so I have one. Oh, uh, good. Uh, so personally, I've been somewhat interested in uh, transhumanism in connection with uh, transformative AI scenarios. Uh, but I have a very vague idea, or maybe none at all, how transhumanism and posthumanism relate to each other. Can you mm -hmm. help me with that? Yes. <laughs> so yeah. So I uh, again, I'm, I come from a critical posthumanist perspective. So I come from a perspective of posthumanist that is very much affiliated with feminist and decolonial types of theories. So, and they tend to oppose the idea of, uh, they are opposed to the idea of transhumanism because in their understanding, uh, and the little that I've read of transhumanism seem to be uh, in accordance with this view, um, the transhuman is more of an extension of these humanist ideals. So it still keeps the, the human much intact, but it adds this idea of creating the, uh, a superhuman or super intelligence and so on. And that does not need to be bad from a posthumanist perspective in general, because it is um, the idea of the cyborg, for example, has been advanced by Donna Haraway early on. And uh, in her conception, it is like a way of thinking about technology as not necessarily something that is always bad, but <laughs> which is obvious maybe from those of you who come from more technology oriented perspective but from a, a, from, a, from that time in writing in feminist theory the cyborg and thinking about technology as something that could be good was um didn't like didn't sit in the mainstream of critical theory let's say so it has affiliation in the sense um that both of these perspectives uh, are against the pure idea of the human or the pure idea of the human body and think affirmatively around technology as something that could be uh, useful for, um, for critical projects as well and uh, to transcend the, the boundaries of the human body and the, also the, the normative idea of the human body as, and how a human body looks like. But then the posthumanist perspective is a bit more um folk or it is substantially more focused as far as i know on uh, these uh, tra more traditional feminist questions or decolonial questions and also trying to question what was the human to start with and uh, who is included in the human and uh, how can we now be transhuman when uh, some of us were never human to start with so so that is the kind of a bit of a conflict line and also of course a critique against how marketized these movements towards transhumanism is and like some people can travel to the moon but most don't have even access to basic medicines as we have seen this pandemic not the least thank you are there further comments or questions now we have something from dominica here do you want to turn on your microphone and, yeah. and ask yeah, out loud? Yeah, I can do that. I hope you can hear me. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess I just wanted to know like your experience because I also work with uh, post-human theory uh, and how how it is received uh, from your peers in, in the legal world, um, how easy it is for you to talk about this or to introduce these kinds of thoughts because for me it was when I first read this, this was very transformative in a way like, oh, we have to rethink everything. <laughs> and um, sometimes I feel like, okay, we have to find like different ways to communicate these ideas. So it doesn't, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. So I just wanted to know your experience of like. Yeah. No, it's an excellent question. What's your disciplinary background, can I ask? 
Uh, I am currently in gender studies, a PhD. All right. Um, so, <laughs> but yeah, I that come be. from psychology and yeah. uh, okay. neuroscience yeah. a bit. All right, that's great. Okay, yeah, so um, hmm. <laughs> where do I start? Of course, it is a challenge to introduce post-humanist theory as a PhD candidate in, in a field, especially a field such as law. Uh, in Gothenburg, it was probably less of a struggle than in many other places, since it is a very, like, uh, it has a tradition of critical legal theory, it is a tradition of feminist legal theory, so, um, the theoretical group there is very open to uh, to new influences so say now i was not the first but that's a good, again practical thing it is good to not be the absolutely the first person doing it and uh, there are uh, there were already some work carried out by professors in law that i could kind of relate my project to so that like that kind of authority uh, helps so it's good to not be entirely alone and first. And then the second thing is that, of course, one has to, to some degree to work with the disciplinary material. So like what one cannot just uh, ignore what has been said uh, in the discipline and one has to think another round of what am I actually contributing with adding this perspective to uh, the traditional legal perspectives. And I am by no means finished by that. I have now been a doctor for four years almost, and I've been working with I've been working with this for almost 10 years now. So but so that's a constant process, I think, to find new ways to see if it adds something. And if it doesn't add, then like kill your darlings it doesn't need to be the super theory that explains everything. And in, uh, in the, those sense, maybe you find a way to express what you wanted to say with a theory uh, better without it like you could see things with it but then maybe back away from it so so that's also like depends on how um how much it adds and what you find because that's a continuous process of going back and forth with the theory and the material i think but also i mean it's still very much in the it was still very much in the um in a trial and error when I defended with it. Now it's become super big posthumanism and more than human theories in law. It's like everywhere now when there's an anthology coming out every month, it feels so. Thank you. Good to be uh, first sometimes as well. We have hmm? a question, possibly a challenging question from yeah. Jack. Jack, do you want to ask it? Yes, thank you for this talk, uh, Janice. I li really liked it. Um, I was wondering if the uh, post-humanist uh, ethics stance you take uh, mm -hmm. could be reconciled with the information ethics. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but which has been propagated by Luciana Floridi, which yeah. let, kind of conceptualizes human beings as uh, information organisms. And this is more based like an information flow. I, I can see it can be reconciled in, in a way, but I would like to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, it's a good question, and I I must confess that it was <laughs> in around 2017 that I last looked at uh, this uh, his ethics. So I'm not entirely sure when I have read him. I haven't felt that it is very different now from posthumanism. But then again, he doesn't really um, go into detail. Uh, with feminist questions or decolonial questions or um, like how ethics is political, if I have understood him correctly, what would you say? I think it would be really great for the rest of us if either you, Janike, or maybe yeah. Jack could yeah. give a one or two sentence yeah. summary, if that is possible, of, of this information ethics. Jack, are you up to the challenge? Hard to summarize, maybe because yeah, it's yeah. <laughs> he, he writes quite long and, mm -hmm. and sorry, dense I, text. <laughs> sorry, I, I was talking to my microphone. Oh, okay. It was on mute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it considers human beings as a kind of computers, which is uh, connected in uh, systems that flows, uh, that distribute flows of information. 
And uh, in this way, uh, you can see a human being as part of a system that exchanges information. So his ethics is based on uh, what the data can be shared and, and how you, let's say, uh, are a human being uh, in as being a part of a greater system. Um, in, in that sense, um, that that's there has a there has a posthumanist stance to it, yes. but it it's it doesn't have a critical stance, just as Jen has alluded to. Eh? So there is no really uh, a, a postcolonial or feminist or whatever critical hermeneutical st uh, take you uh, uh, stance you take. Yeah, no, and I think that's where it kind of that's where they um, uh, differentiate themselves because uh, it that kind of cybernetic way of thinking about the placement of the body, both human and non-human bodies uh, in a larger organism and like it, there's transfer of flows and energies between bodies, that is very much part of posthuman thinking as well or posthumanist thinking. But then it's more of like this kind of ethical um, uh, political uh, considerations that are explicit in, in critical posthumanist theory that might not be in, um, in Floridi. But he might be useful anyway for that. So. All right. Thank you. Further questions? Well, then, mm -hmm. if, if there are no further questions, yes. uh, thank you again for this yeah. beautiful thank talk. Thank you so much and, for this. Oh, there's, oh, 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 there's a hand. Pamela. That's here. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, thank you very much. Um, uh, first of all, thank you very much, Janice, for your for your lecture, actually. Um, I'm Pamela Moraga. I'm a lawyer by training and a diplomat as practitioner. I'm posted in Geneva um, and in Geneva uh, to the United Nations, where the convention on certain conventional weapons carries out the discussion on lethal autonomous weapon systems. So perhaps the question will be really off mark here, but one of the aspects that we have discussed in the GGE on laws, as it is called, is the fact the dehumanization of warfare, thanks to this, the involvement of technology and artificial mm. intelligence, mm. Um, basically. Uh, in um, weapon systems. Mm. Um, in your view, how one of the arguments that's been made, and this is related to the ethical question, is uh, how the human being is removed from the moment in which mm. lethal force is applied, uh, and how that affects human dignity, and mm. how that affects, as I said before at the beginning, the, the dehumanization of warfare. Have you studied this from a post-humanism point of view? Uh, I think it's fascinating, and I think mm -hmm. that at some point, these discourses in terms of international regulation of aspects such as security, for instance, mm -hmm. will have to merge at some point. I'd like just your general views on this, if possible, and thank yeah. you. Of course, no, thank you so much for that question. So, so interesting. And yes, there is actually quite a lot of work in international law on posthumanism and, and autonomous weapons. Yes. So, uh, well, um, so I'm not a civil law um, person myself, or like private law. So I, uh, that's not my specialization, but I can say something. And I agree that it is, uh, I mean, the usually the kind of uh, advantages that the post-human or like the transhuman way of thinking about autonomous weapon is that uh, less civilians would be killed. So therefore it's more of a humane weapon, but, uh, and then it becomes a question how, who is the, who is responsible and who, who is the human, who is the machine and so on. So that kind of discussion is, is often discussed, but to me, I think if one would take like a strictly post-humanist perspective, a critical post-humanist perspective, there, I mean, it's hard to rationalize weapons in general because, and especially weapons that are these kind of automized laws of war, because it is a form of necropolitics, as member would say. So it is, and posthumanist theory. Um, I mean, it's it's fundamentally opposed to to warfare and lawfare. Uh, 
I uh, so um yeah what yeah I um I don't know if I would say it is the the removal of the human per se that is the problem but rather that we have even more efficient weapons that actually can buy um collection of data identify and kill people and erase people from uh, so that is i think it's a big problem that that uh, and the posthumanist international lawyers have put in quite a lot of work to explore so i would be happy to send you some examples if you want to email i would love that thank you very good um we are out of time yes. so we will have to uh, close this uh, very interesting session. Thank you, Janike, for your Thank you uh, so much. And thank you for all your questions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. Yeah. Um, Great. Have a nice week, everyone. And uh, hopefully the last times of the pandemic.